my singing lips, my mouth will praise you. That's it, church. That's what praising is all about. It's not when it comes easily. It's not when we just feel like doing it. But when we really say that I'm a believer of Jesus Christ, I will make the choice to fight for my faith. I will make the choice to praise God, even when I might not feel like it. What a beautiful line that says, because your love is better than life. Life is hard. Life has really hard moments, but God is greater. His love is greater. And a promise that Jesus gives to us, we have to cling to that says, take heart. He says, you will have trouble in this world, but take heart. Christ tells us, I have overcome the world. Don't forget that. Don't let your feelings dictate your faith. Don't let your feelings dictate your praise. That we could say how great is our God. I know this song, we've done it a million times in this church. But don't let it grow old on you. I want to invite each and every person here this morning that no matter what you're going through, no matter what you feel like this morning, and even when you leave this church, because that's when it gets harder, right? That you would lift your hands. As the psalmist says, I will lift my hands with my singing lips. I will praise you. Let's put the focus on God, not on us. Let's put the focus on the glory of God, on the greatness of God, and not ourselves this morning. Church, let's lift our voices. Can we do that this morning? Can you just say with me really quick, just say, how great is our God? How great is our God? Can you say it loud? Can you say, how great is our God? How great is our God? He is great. He is worthy. Let's sing to him. This is for him. All glory do his name.
Let's pray together. Oh God, you are great. You are greater than the situations and the things that come our way. God, forgive us when we see those things and they become a roadblock to our faith. But God, I pray today that we would be encouraged to praise your name. Even if all we can do is say that, I praise you. I praise you. Sometimes that's all that we can get out of our mouths because it's too hard. So God, I pray today that you would help us to praise you through the storms, that our faith would not be dictated by what's going on, but we would rest in who you are, that we would have hope and faith in almighty God. Again, I always go back to Jeremiah 23, 17. Our sovereign Lord, you who made the heavens and the earth, nothing is too difficult for you. Help us to have the faith to believe that if you formed everything that we can see in such a short amount of time, then you can handle the things that seem like mountains to us. They're so small in your sight. God, increase our faith today. I pray for Ricky, Lord, would you just bless him? Father, what an amazing young man he is. Would you bless him right now? Give him the words to say that they would be your words. And Lord, would we be attuned to your spirit? Holy Spirit, work in our lives, work in our hearts, even now. God, we lift our hands. We praise you for who you are. We give you glory. We give you honor. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated.
up, I loved his movies. I could watch Jumanji a million times and it never gets old. You know, all, you can ask the summer camp and the after school care kids that I work with. I have like single-handedly made it my mission to make sure that every kid I come in contact with has watched that movie because it just, it brings so many childhood memories. You know, Flubber uh, loved that movie as a kid. Uh, I remember every time that Hook was on TV, I would be watching with my older brother. Uh, and the list goes on and on. I mean, who doesn't picture him when you hear Genie from Aladdin now? And so he, he was a monumental um, actor in, in, in our society, and he had this, this ability about him. He could, he could make you, you know, laugh till you peed and, and cry and, and ponder the greater things of life all at the same time, like no other. And that's why it became a shock when a little over a year ago, he passed away. You know, he, he had the talent and, and the money and, and, the, and the fame, and it seemed, he seemed like a, a happy-go-lucky guy, like he had his life together. But in his death, we see that underneath it all, he struggled. And today, this morning, we're going to look at the death of Saul. And when you looked at Saul in the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel, you would think that he had his life together, that he was, you know, called to lead uh, Israel as, as, as the first king appointed by God and that, that he looked and he fit the part. But today, as we look at his final moments, we see what was underneath it all. And I'm gonna, uh, today we're going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 31, if you want to turn there with me. If you don't have your Bibles with you, the blue ones in front of you on, are in English and will also be behind me on the screens as well in just a moment. I'll give you a little warning before we start reading that today's passage is a little bit uh, solemn. There's a lot of, of death going on, and so it's not a very uh, happy passage to read, I guess you could say. Uh, but I promise that, that we won't leave it there, so um, just bear with me. So 1 Samuel, Samuel chapter 31, if you would stand with me as we do in our church as a sign of respect to God's word. It says, Now the Philistines fought against Israel. The Israelites fled before them, and many fell dead. On Mount Gilbao. The Philistines were in hot pursuit of Saul and his sons, and they kill, killed his sons Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malachi Shua. The fighting grew fierce around Saul, and when the archers overtook him, they wounded him critically. Saul said to his armor bearer, Draw your sword and run me through, or these uncircumcised fellows will come and run me through and abuse me. But his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it. So Saul took his own sword and fell on it. When the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. When the Israelites along the valley and those across the Jordan saw that Israelite army had fled and that Saul and his sons had died, they abandoned their towns and fled. And the Philistines came and occupied them. Amen. May the Lord bless the scripture reading. You may be seated. So as we're looking at the account of the death of Saul, we're, we're not talking about, about specifically suicide here or depression. Um, because in, in this time period, the, the method that Saul took his life was, um, was customary in war as, as a way to not let your uh, enemy take your life. So today we're not focusing on that so much. We're focusing on the outcome of the life that he lived. And the first outcome we'll look at is the outcome for Israel. Israel was God's chosen people. And, and in the beginning of chapter 4, we see that, that uh, Israel had been defeated by the Philistines and, and, and their, the, the ark of God, which symbolized God's, God's presence, had been captured from the Israelites. And so the Israelites were in desperation and they demanded for a king to go out and fight their battles so that they could be like the other nations. And God gave them that king in Saul, the people's choice, as we talked about in the beginning of this sermon series. And how ironic is it that the reason that they asked for a king was to defeat the Philistines, and yet the very king they asked for was defeated by the Philistines. See, 1 Samuel ends with Israel in the same situation as it began, defeated by the Philistines. And this time, they didn't lose their ark. They lost their king. Israel 
didn't go anywhere. Saul just took them in a big circle. Israel wanted a human king. They wanted to be like the other nations. And in Saul's death, we see the foolishness of what they asked for. See, the foolishness of that request is the same as the ones that we make today. When we place our hope in things of this earth, when we place our hope in human power, how often do we think, if I just had this one thing, if I just had this king, right, as Israel said, if I just had this job, if I just had this relationship, if I just had these friends, if I just had this or that, then everything would be okay, right? And as we see in this passage, everything on earth will fail us until our hope is no longer in things of this earth. So the question this morning is, what do you put your hope in? What do you lean on? Will you be like Israel, who wanted a human king, who wanted the power in their hands, or will you allow God to be your king? Will you make him the true king? See, God, Israel didn't, and look at the outcome for them. The second outcome we'll look at today is the outcome of Saul. Saul started out as a humble man, right? He looked like a leader. It says in the passage that uh, in, in 1 Samuel, uh, when he's first introduced in the beginning of the, of the book, it says that he was as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. So not to say that looks are, you know, the most important thing in being a leader, but I'm sure it doesn't hurt. And, he, you know, he looked the part. He looked like he, you know, was God's chosen one. He was godly uh, when he started out as king. And so the question is, what happened? We've been seeing for weeks the mistake after mistake that Saul has made and the failure after failure of Saul when he became overcome by pride and by envy, when he became more concerned about his own will than God's will, when he became, uh, began saying rather than doing and making excuses, rather than confessing and offering sacrifice, rather than obeying. See, Saul valued reputation over character. And this is the Saul we find today. This is the fall of Saul. And, and I think it's so easy to happen in life. You know, I remember a couple months ago, we were going to Disney World on a family vacation uh, to go to Star Wars weekend. And so, um, you know, we packed up and stuff and we're heading out to the car and I was so excited because I, I didn't have to drive. And uh, I got home late the night before from youth group, and so we get in the car, and I just jump into the back seat, and I kid you not, before we even pulled out the driveway, I promise you, I was knocked out already. And so uh, I'm just knocked out, and, and about three hours later, I guess, three and a half hours later, I wake up, and we're in Disney World already, and somehow everyone in the car has already eaten breakfast, and I'm like, what? How did this happen? Where are we right now? And how many times has that happened to our lives spiritually, where one day... We can't even recognize where we are. See, spiritual decline is a gradual process, but it's a slow and slippery slope. And sometimes we don't even realize that we're falling. I believe that, that if we are not moving in the direction of God, then, then we are moving farther from him. There, there's no such thing as stagnant Christianity. We can't just stay where we're at. We're either growing closer to God are, f are drawing farther and farther away from him. And so we have to look at our lives so that we would not become like Saul. And, and there's a big contrast here in the outcome of Saul's life versus that of David's life. See, in, in chapter, uh, chapter 31, is believed to be happening simultaneously as the chapter before, chapter 30. And in chapter 30, at the same time that, that the Philistines are overtaking Saul and his army, uh, D David is in another part um, of Israel, and, and after finding strength in God, it says that he drove out the Amalekites and, and rescued his people from the enemies. And so here you have David. While Saul is being pursued by the Philistines and defeated by the Philistines, David having a very different outcome. See, David succeeded 
where Saul failed. David, in the beginning of the, of the book, drove out the Philistines after killing the Goliath. Saul was taken down by them. David sought the Lord through the trials in his life. Saul did not. David listened and obeyed God's commands. Saul did not. David was led by the Lord, and Saul was not. See, they were both chosen by God. They were both given the purpose of serving and saving God's people. They were both equipped by God. But Saul, Saul was disobedient to God's word. He didn't follow God's leading. And there are two types of characters here, Saul and David. One overcome by pride, the other humbled himself and obeyed. Who will we be this morning? Will we be like Saul and make our lives about us? Or will we follow the example of David and allow God to lead our lives, to follow his will, not our own? The book of First and Second Chronicles, um, it, it retells the same stories that we're reading in, in this sermon series, but from a spiritual perspective. And when it talks about this passage that we just read in First Samuel, the death of Saul, listen to what it says about Saul's death. It says, Saul died because he was unfaithful to the Lord. He did not keep the word of the Lord and even consulted a medium for guidance and did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. That was the outcome of Saul. And, and you know what the saddest part of this chapter in 1 Samuel chapter 1 if you have it open, look, look back in the scriptures, in, in, the, in those first seven verses. Can, can anyone tell me, how many times is God mentioned in this passage? Let me ask you guys. How many times in these seven verses that we read, recalling Saul's life, how many times is God mentioned? The answer is none. God is not mentioned once in the whole chapter. And that's kind of a big deal because this book is about him. So for God not to be mentioned is kind of a big deal. But I think that it, it reflects Saul's life. See, it's dangerous when God is not mentioned. And I think when we look at our lives, I mean, how many times would God be mentioned in, in my obituary, right? Does my life point to God or point to myself? Because if it doesn't point to God, then it was wasted. Will others, when they look at my life, will they see a person in desperation as Saul was? Or will they see a person who is desperately seeking after God as David was? So as we look at the outcome of Saul, I pray that we would not make the same mistakes, that we would follow God's will and not our own. And our final outcome that we'll look at this morning is the outcome of sin. You know, the danger of Saul's shortcomings was not so much just that it made him look like a bad person, but that it affected those around him. The decisions that Saul made internally poured out externally in the form of disaster that it caused. And that is so true because the sin that we think no one will find out about, the sin that we think doesn't affect anyone else, will, in fact, affect others. We've all heard that phrase, you know, what's done in the dark comes to life, comes to light, sorry. But the truth of the matter is, is that even if it doesn't come to light, it still affects others, and its sin still has consequences. And too often in our lives, the consequences of our sin are not just paid by us, but paid by those around us. For Saul, the outcome of his sin was death. And not just his own death, but the death of all those around him. In verse 6 of the passage, it says that Saul and his three sons and his armor bearer and all his men died together that same day. Look at all of these deaths in this chapter. And perhaps the saddest of these deaths is his son, Jonathan. Remember, we preached on, this, on his son a couple weeks ago on Jonathan, who was Saul's son, but ironically, David's best friend, even when Saul was trying to kill David. 
and, and Saul, uh, Jonathan responded to God's purpose for his life. And he was, a, he was a good and godly influence in David's life. He made a covenant with David. He recognized David as God's appointed king when Saul wouldn't. He gave David his robe and his sword, signifying giving up his heir as king so that David would fulfill the, pl the plan that God had for him. He planned to be second in command in David's kingdom, and he never got a chance because of his father's failure as king. Do you see what we lost? There are consequences to our sin. See, Saul's sin affected his sons, his armor bearer, his army, and it affected his nation. Our sins affect our family, our friends, our church, the people around us. When we rebel against God's will, we hurt our family and our friends. We fail to serve the purpose that we're called to in his body, the church. And we can so easily lead people around us astray. I think we can all think of a time when our sin hurt the people around us. Sin hurts more than ourselves and more than just God. Sin hurts all and all of Israel suffered for the sins of Saul. And so in the final passage, we see Israel fleeing for their lives as their king is dead. And the question for Israel is what now? And so as we come to a close, I promised that we wouldn't leave the sermon as depressing as we started it off. And the beautiful part is, is that in the midst of this sin and in the midst of this suffering, God didn't leave Israel in desperation. And he won't leave us there either. God knew when he appointed Saul as king that he would fail. But he knew that he was going to send Israel a true king who would not fail them. In the same way that God gave Israel David to be the king to lead that nation, he gave us his son, Saul, the first king of Israel, died leading his nation. But Jesus, the last king, died for all nations so that all would be made whole in him. After Saul's death, Israel had no king and no hope against the enemy. And because of sin, we have no hope from the enemy spiritually. But Jesus came to step into our sin and into our suffering to bring peace into the chaos of our lives, to bring, to bring uh, light into the darkness of this world, to bring hope into the hopelessness, to restore those break, broken relationships, to, to undo the consequences of sin. That, Redeemer Church, is the true king, the true king who humbled himself. He was not prideful. He was not envious. He obeyed the Father. He became that friend to us. He gave us his robe. He defeated the enemy for us. The true king did not die, but he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And one day, we will get to see that king for all of eternity. Redeemer Church, this morning, do you see the true king? Because it will change your outcome for eternity. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are that true king in our lives. Lord, would you forgive us for the times that we seek our own king, that we put our hope in other things that are not you. When we lean on other things that are not you, would you help us to depend on you and you alone? Father, will you forgive us when we make our lives more about ourselves and about you, when we seek our own reputation rather than making you known? And Lord, would you turn our lives around that you would become the center that at everything we do, you would be seen through it, God. And Lord, would you forgive us for those times that we've wronged you, when we've wronged those around us. Lord, would you help us to see the weight of our sin and the consequences of it. And would you allow us to bring that sin before you and allow you to change us 
allow you to forgive us and allow you to restore us. Lord, I thank you because you in our lives as our king are, is pushing back the darkness, God. You are bringing hope, God, when we have none. You are bringing your light and your restoration into our lives, God. You are that true king that will never fail us, God. And I pray that we would cling to that, God, that we would make you the king of our lives, that others would see us and see the king in us. God, do not let us waste our lives. Lord, let the outcome be for you and your glory. And Lord, we long for that day when we will get to be one with you for all of eternity, sitting and worshiping the true king. That is the day that our hearts long for. We thank you for your son, for what he's done for us. And I pray that we would live in response to that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame with glory and freedom. Our God is the only righteous judge, ruling over us with kindness and wisdom. We will keep our eyes on
The only thing is that, again, I want to encourage every woman. Um, I talked to someone last week that says, oh, if I start to saving $20 and $20 and $20, paid off. So please, every woman, I want to encourage you to set aside April 1st and 2nd. It's a Friday evening and Saturday morning to lunch, and then we'll have lunch over here in the fellowship hall. Uh, but it's right here at UM, so it's very, very convenient for our church, um, and also because you don't have to take off of work. So please set that aside, and like I said, just start saving 20, 20, 20, and you're done. So.
Changing us, there is a trend. 